Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Violence rages across Syria as battered Aleppo loses 115 lives. Mass anger erupts on Bahrain's streets after leaders of the uprising lose appeal. And Israel's expansion policies separate Palestinian children from their schools across the West Bank. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. Today was a black day for Aleppo that was stained with the blood of more than 115 people killed in the shelling of the province. These victims are added to the nearly 70 others who were killed in the countryside of Damascus, Deir Azur, and other Syrian cities. These figures were reported by activists today. As for Homs, the pace of the violence is not subsiding as a number of deaths were reported in the clashes between the Free Army and the regime's forces. More details in this report by Zuhair Sakallah. As of today, these children will no longer have any recollection of their childhood's features or its stages. They will only remember scenes of blood, destruction, and the repercussions of the actions taken by the regime forces. Their innocent childhood was stained with blood, causing them pain at a young age. They are the children from Aleppo. They are among dozens of victims whose houses were subjected to tank shells and warplane gunfire. Today, Aleppo was stained with the blood of many of its children, especially here in the city of Atarib and the neighborhoods of Huneino, where homes and everything that moved were shelled by warplanes. The circle of violence was maintained inside Homs as the province witnessed the deaths of nearly 45 people after violent clashes erupted between the Free Army and the regime's army, which used all the ammunition and bombs it possesses. Violence in the countryside of Damascus was just as severe. Tank and air shelling was amplified, forcing residents to flee after smoke columns rose and power and water were cut off. Not far away from here, regime forces were committing a massacre after arresting and then killing nearly 20 people in Duma. As for those who were not subjected to the shelling, they were executed with gunfire. <laughs> Rights organizations reported that regime forces executed four people in the neighborhood of Al-Qusur in Deir Azur after the Free Army announced its control over the Hamdan military airport in the city of Al-Bukamal. As for Hama, it witnessed arrests and indiscriminate gunfire on civilian homes, leading to the deaths of 11 people in the neighborhood of al Faraya. In exchange, the Free Syrian Army mobilized to attack the regime forces, besieging the training colleges in Deir Azur, then destroying a number of the army's armored vehicles and capturing some regime soldiers from inside the building after clashes erupted and led to the deaths of individuals from both parties. Different parts of Bahrain witnessed angry demonstrations in condemnation of the verdicts issued against 13 detained opposition figures. Dozens were injured with shotgun pellets used by the regime's forces during their crackdown on the marches. For its part, the opposition in Bahrain condemned the verdicts and considered them illegal. Britain, Denmark and international rights organizations also condemned the verdicts and called for the release of the prisoners. Popular anger was expressed in different parts of the country in condemnation of the sentences handed down to 13 opposition figures held in the Bahraini regime's prisons. Slogans denouncing the unjust verdicts were chanted by the participants of a demonstration called for by opposition forces in the area of Barvar. It was held under the banner, We All Sacrifice Ourselves for Our Symbols.
The chants heard in Sitra, al Sanabis, and other areas demanded the annulment of these verdicts and the immediate release of the detainees without any restrictions or preconditions. The protesters confirmed that the popular mobilization will continue until their demands are met. These marches were attacked by regime forces as soon as they were launched with shotgun pellet and poisonous gas grenades. The result was several injuries and cases of suffocation. Opposition forces condemned the verdicts and considered them invalid, saying they were based on systematic retaliation. They held the international community accountable for favoring al manamas regime and for failing to take measures to push the regime to respect the law and international human rights charters. The Bahrainis confirmed that they will not return to their homes and that they are committed to the reasons they took to the street on February 14, 2011, despite the major sacrifices and a continued presence in the squares. Internationally, Amnesty International condemned the verdicts and described them as shameful, calling on al Manama to annul them. As for Denmark, it objected to the decision to uphold the life sentence against rights activist Abdul Hadi al Khawaja and called on the international community to deal firmly with the al Manama regime over its failure to respect human rights. With that, the British Foreign Office Minister for the Middle East and North Africa, Alastair Burt, expressed disappointment over the verdicts issued by the Bahraini regime. The Arab Network for Human Rights considered the verdicts a continuation of the arbitrary measures taken against the activists and regime opponents who took part in the Bahraini uprising and called for reforms. The U.S.-led force helicopter crashes in Afghanistan, killing two soldiers. The U.S.-led mission confirms the casualties and says the cause of the crash is under investigation. Our correspondent in Kabul, Faiz Khorshid, has more. Yeah, this helicopter went down in Lugar province, two hours drive from Kabul city. It has been confirmed by NATO headquarters here in Kabul. And this helicopter uh, went down during a military operation in that part of this country. It's one of the volatile provinces of Afghanistan. And there were six foreign soldiers on board. Four of them have been badly injured. Two others were killed. And the, the cause of the crash is still not known, but the Taliban militants quickly came out with a statement saying that their founders brought it down. What they're saying is that they killed 10 American soldiers uh, when their helicopters were brought down. They're saying they brought down two U.S. helicopters in uh, Lugar province, something that has been rejected by NATO headquarters here in Kabul. Following the U.N. bid for statehood by Palestinian authorities, the Israeli foreign minister has threatened to cut electricity to the occupied West Bank. The acting Palestinian Authority chief has called a private meeting to discuss the recent Israeli threats. Mahmoud Abbas is also working on ways to strengthen his ties with the non-aligned movement following the Tehran summit. A correspondent, Nell Burden, has more. In a speech, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Avigdor Levin, attacked the Palestinian Authority chief, Mahmoud Abbas, calling him a terrorist who will have to be eliminated. Furthermore, Israel is now taking measures which include threatening to cut the electricity supply to large areas of the West Bank due to an unpaid bill of $125 million. Israeli electricity is distributed to the West Bank by the Jerusalem District Electricity Company, a private firm. In a news conference last week, officials of the Jerusalem Company said some 12 Palestinian refugee camps in the West Bank were the main debtors, even though the electricity supplies are controlled and paid by UNRWA for refugee camps. In fact, uh, Lieberman's threatening uh, threats uh, reflects uh, uh, the Israeli uh, government uh, policy that seeks uh, to exert more pressure uh, first uh, on uh, President uh, Mahmoud Abbas in order to push him to uh, resume negotiations without any uh, preconditions or demands from the Palestinian uh, side. If that doesn't succeed, uh, uh, the Israelis are uh, uh, serious uh, in continuing their uh, plan in order to get rid of the Palestinian uh, uh, leadership. Mahmoud Abbas held a private meeting with politicians and members of the non-aligned movement to make a strategic plan for the UN seat alongside discussing the threats issued from Israel. Policies by the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Mahmoud Abbas on the international stage have angered Israel and put them in a corner. Even the resolution by the Islamic Conference in Mecca a non-aligned movement in Tehran and the conference in South Africa for international socialists 
All of this suggests that the PLO has a body in the UN. This angered Israel and created a failure for them on the international stage. Lieberman's remarks, which reflect that of Israeli policy, were repeated several times in the past few days, coming in part as a response to the PA's plans to restart negotiations at the UN, recognizing Palestinian statehood and accepting Palestine as a member state at the UN. Palestinian political analysts claim that Lieberman's speech was merely a scare tactic to stop any preconditions towards the negotiations towards the UN seat for statehood. This includes the expansion of settlements. Nell Burden, Press TV, Occupied Ramallah. نصل إلى قضيتنا هذا المساء وهي فلسطينية فمع بدء العام الدراسي الجديد يواجه طلبة الفلسطينيين With the start of the new school year, Palestinian students across the West Bank are facing difficulties caused by their school's location near Israeli settlements or the separation wall. Al-Tira Beit Aur Al-Fuka is one of the schools students now have to take long and rough roads to reach after it got surrounded by the wall and the settlements. Students in the town of Atira, west of Ramallah, wake up early since the road some of them take to school is four kilometers long, or nearly two and a half miles. Most of the road is rough and mountainous, but it was imposed by a political reality that came about decades after the school was built in the 1950s. Nearby, settlements and a main road were constructed to serve the Israelis, leaving the Palestinians with the shoulder of the road, through which students reach a tunnel that is flooded with rainwater during the winter. The Jews have surrounded us, and there is no other road to take. In the winter, this tunnel is full of water. Some of the school's students come from the town of Beit Aur al Fuka that the wall separated from the school. Around 200 students attend the school, and for years, the school's administration has been prohibited from adding any classrooms to its old buildings. This main gate was closed because of this wall. We had no choice but to install an alternative gate, and it was also closed. So now we have only one entrance, the southern gate, which is a small gate that only students can pass through. We can't bring anything else through it. It is only for the students. The problem facing Palestinian students using this road and thousands of others is that their education is insignificant for Israel, since its only concern in the West Bank is the security of its army and its settlers. Three settlements surround the town of El Yanur, east of Nablus, where only a few dozen of its residents remain. Most left because of the harassment of the settlers, which also almost caused school to shut down. It gets worse every year. We have less and less students every year because the town's residents are fleeing the harassment of the settlers and their attacks on the town, so there are less students. Most residents moved to a nearby town, but eight students stayed in this school that is deprived by the occupation from any structural development or renovations to its crumbling rooms. Shirin Abu Akle, Al Jazeera, West Ramallah. The Security Cabinet meeting on the Iranian issue was abruptly ended today when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said someone in the group betrayed the national trust by leaking details of its top secret discussions from yesterday's session. Citing an unnamed source who had taken part in yesterday's meeting, Yediot Achronot reported that Israel's intelligence agencies gave the Security Cabinet conflicting views on Iran's nuclear program. The Security Cabinet is the only body authorized to approve military attacks, but the official who leaked details 
details to Idiot said that no operational decisions were made during the meeting. However, the get together yesterday is believed to be the first time in months that this highly classified body conducted an in depth discussion on Iran that is believed to have included timelines, Iran's zones of immunity, and what additional sanctions could be still be adopted. Infrastructure Minister Uzi Landau said after Netanyahu's announcement today ending the meeting that all participants should take polygraph tests to discover who leaked the information. The Democratic National Convention got underway in Charlotte, North Carolina last night, and one hot topic was Israel. A change in the Democratic Party platform, dropping language declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, was slammed by the Republicans, and the Democrats answered back with a primetime speech defending Obama's record on Israel. IBS Eli Wagelenter has more. The topic of Israel took on a prominent role at the opening of the Democratic National Convention last night. Delegates at first voted to adopt the party platform that focused on President Barack Obama's call for higher taxes on wealthier Americans while backing same-sex marriage and abortion rights. But it was the words missing from the plank on Israel that was a source of the most controversy. The Democratic Party dropped the sentence recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, a change from four years ago when the party platform stated unequivocally that Jerusalem is and will remain the capital of Israel. This year's platform makes no mention of Jerusalem, but instead expresses unshakable commitment to Israel's security. That omission led to Republicans slamming the Democrats for abandoning Israel. Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney blasted the DNC for not mentioning Israel's claim to Jerusalem in its platform. Quote, it is unfortunate that the entire Democratic Party has embraced President Obama's shameful refusal to acknowledge that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, Romney said in a statement emailed to reporters. Four years of President Obama's repeated attempts to create distance between the United States and our cherished ally have led the Democratic Party to remove from their platform an unequivocal acknowledgment of a simple reality. The Republican Jewish coalition issued a statement saying the Obama administration is, quote, painfully out of touch with the mainstream of the Jewish community. Democrats hit back hard at the critics, devoting a coveted 8 o'clock primetime slot on opening night of their convention to a blatant appeal for Jewish votes. In what is likely the first ever convention speech devoted strictly to Israel, in a primetime slot when the arena is full and cable networks are broadcasting live, former Florida Representative Robert Wexler defended the Democratic Party platform as strongly standing behind Israel. Over the past four years, the president has proven this commitment time and again in both word and deed. And the Democratic Party platform reflects the president's unflinching commitment to Israel's security and future as a Jewish state. <laughs> to strengthen Israel's qualitative military advantage, the president has increased security assistance to Israel to record levels, more than any other president. When he visited Stero in 2008, an Israeli town along the Gaza border besieged by constant rocket attacks, President Obama saw for himself the terrible toll terrorism takes on Israelis. And that's why he secured the funds to deploy the Iron Dome anti-rocket defense system, which has already saved countless Israeli lives. The Democratic Convention continues tonight and tomorrow night when President Obama will deliver his acceptance speech. Ellie Wogelanter, IBA News. Mauritanian television announced that Nouakchott has handed over Abdullah al sunusi the former head of Muammar al-Qaddafi's secret services, to the Libyan authorities without providing additional details. al sunusi was arrested six months ago in Mauritania, which led the authorities to repeatedly ask for his extradition so he could be prosecuted. al sunusi is also wanted by the International Criminal Court and France over suspicions of having committed crimes during the late Colonel Muammar al qaddafis rule.
He was considered the late Colonel Muammar al-Gaddafi's right hand and the keeper of his secrets. Abdullah al-Sanusi, the director of the Libyan intelligence services, was captured in Mauritania for entering the country with a fake passport after leaving Libya following the downfall of the Gaddafi regime in March. Ever since, Tripoli has been requesting his extradition so he can face charges for crimes committed during the reign of the late Colonel. Mauritanian state television announced the surprising move that Nouakchott handed Sanusi over to Tripoli without providing additional details. However, other news outlets clarified that a Libyan delegation, headed by the ministers of justice and finance, accompanied al Sanusi aboard a flight to Tripoli. In Libya, dozens of charges await al Sanusi. The most important is the allegation that hundreds of political prisoners were executed in the Abu Salim prison in 1996. They were showered with bullets for three hours. al Sanusi is also wanted by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity committed during the Libyan revolution against Colonel Muammar al-Gaddafi. In France, al Sanusi was tried in absentia for his role in the bombing of UTA Flight 772 above the western desert that led to the killing of dozens of people. Al-Sanusi is also believed to have knowledge or secrets about the bombing of the American Pan Am flight over Scotland in 1988 in what is known as the Lockerbie case. Mauritania is requesting assurances that Al-Sanusi will receive a fair trial and won't be subjected to torture or abuse in accordance with international law. Wafa Zayan, BBC. Egyptian public investigator Mohamed Massoub accused Britain of being one of the worst countries housing smuggled Egyptian assets. Massoub's accusation came as part of an investigative documentary by the British channel, the BBC, about stolen Egyptian money. The BBC revealed in its investigation that British authorities stalled the process of freezing Egyptian deposits and assets belonging to figures of the foreign regime waiting 37 days after Mubarak's toppling to take this measure. The authorities have also not frozen the properties and companies of Mubarak's associates, including his son Gamal's 80 million pound house in London. For more details about the case of Egyptian money in Britain, Dr. Ayman Salama, professor of international law, joins us over the phone. Welcome, doctor. The British Foreign Ministry said that it is impossible to freeze assets based on suspicions. How do you respond to this claim from a legal perspective? And does international law allow for preemptive measures? لا يا فندم هو فعلا زي ما سيادتك تفضلت الحكومة البريطانية مرارا وتكرارا في السابق. No, actually, it is just as you stated. The British Foreign Ministry confirmed over and over, and in official statements, that it asked the Egyptian government to present documents and conclusive evidence proving that the looted assets in Britain belonged to Mubarak and 19 figures of the former regime. But the Egyptian government has not provided the British Foreign Ministry with these documents and conclusive evidence. The United Nations Charter to Combat Corruption requires that Britain and all other countries that sign the charter initiate positive and effective cooperation with countries facing a situation similar to Egypt, Libya, or Tunisia, which had corrupt regimes. These corrupt regimes transferred the stolen assets to countries abroad. However, this same charter stipulates that countries cannot just freeze such assets. This is the preliminary phase and comes before recovering the assets. Britain cannot freeze the assets unless provided with documents and proof. Then, a court ruling has to be issued in Egypt after all appeal procedures have been used, affirming that these stolen assets were traced back to Egypt and were acquired in an illegal manner. Addressing the Sahrawi issue, the Robert Kennedy Foundation announced in an initial report published at the end of its visit to the occupied Sahrawi territories that Morocco has failed to respect human rights in that region.
calling for the establishment of a permanent international mechanism to protect the Sahrawi people. For its part, the Socialist International confirmed its support of the Sahrawi people's right to self-determination through a resolution on Western Sahara approved during the 24th Congress of Socialist International in Cape Town, South Africa. In addition to the security and political crisis in Mali, the food shortage is threatening millions of Malians. The situation there is increasingly looking like a humanitarian crisis. Lack security brought about a dire humanitarian situation. This is what is happening in Mali, where the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs confirmed that the nation is facing a severe food crisis, as some 5 million people are suffering from food shortages. Among them are nearly 270,000 refugees and over 170,000 displaced individuals. The deteriorating security situation forced them to abandon their lands, and that has had negative repercussions on the agricultural sector. The outbreak of cholera that caused the death of 12 people is an additional problem they are facing. Humanitarian agencies are working to extend a helping hand. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is participating in planting rice seedlings north of Mali. UNICEF and its World Food Program are working to protect children and assist those suffering from severe malnutrition nourishment. These programs help alleviate the food crisis. However, the ongoing deteriorating security situation may hinder that progress and even its efficiency, leaving the Malian citizen in a spiral of security and food crises. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.